You're now listening to the Adiel Gorel Show. Each episode, I'll bring you the latest news for my discussions with top health and wellness experts so that you can bring yourself into better health. Today, on the Adiel Gorel Show. I, I agree. I mean, I think whatever, whatever we can do to think... Um, literally and to not be ill clitorate to make a, a joke you know um, <laughs> is uh, is in our uh, best interest because when you look only at intercourse hi everyone it's a joy to be here with you again and today I'm pretty excited here in fact I'm very excited to have uh, you know Ian Kerner with us and we're gonna learn about the What makes life worth living, I think. So that's really exciting for me. But before we even delve, welcome, uh, Ian, to the show. Thank you, Adio. My pleasure. Happy to be here. Looking forward. So m- maybe we can start with your own background. If you can tell us about your journey, what brought you to go deep into sexual health and wellness. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. Um... Not everyone grows up uh, thinking that they're going to end up being a sex therapist. And that certainly wasn't my intention uh, when I was in college, uh, majoring in, uh, in English and, and in psychology. Um, but, you know, I struggled myself, Adiel, with uh, sexual issues. And back then there was no Internet. There wasn't even really a lot of men's magazines. So I had nowhere to really turn for information. But I really struggled with sexual. Um, what's the most common sex what is considered the most common sexual male problem which is early ejaculation uh, we like to think that it's erectile unpredictability um, but that's not the case and so I really wasn't able to uh, engage in the kind of sex that I wanted to have and the kind of sex that I thought I was supposed to have and so I really um, I was quite desperate you know I was quite uh, filled with shame and you It really scarred me, and gradually I began to educate myself about sexuality and, and learn a, a whole lot about how female sexuality really works, which had nothing to do with the way I really thought it should work. And in sort of that sort of was my doorway into sexuality, and it's been an ongoing fascination, and um, it's why, as a therapist, I've really specialized in. In sexuality so it really began with my own sexual issues and uh, it's it's that experience that really gives me my empathy for my patients well you know let me even pose something to you that is coming slightly out of left field if we look and observe nature you know all around us the world <clears throat> the animals procreate the Many of them, especially the mammals, <laughs> in a similar fashion to us. And yet, when they do, they put themselves in a very precarious position. So if uh, two uh, you know, animals in the forest you know, engage in a sexual act, for the duration of that act, they're vulnerable. Somebody could come and attack them and eat them, you know, you know pre- So it behooves, it seems, Nature would want the act to end quickly, and really the fruit or the seed, the, the male ejaculation, seems like nature, again, this is me being a little philosophical here, would have a vested interest in it to happen quickly. You look at rabbits, you drop the male rabbit into a female bag, before you even take him out right away, two of them are already pregnant. So, I mean... When you talked about premature ejaculation, which I understand is very, very common among young people, in a way, aren't they really following the blueprint of what was dictated by nature? Okay, well, that's a fascinating question. First of all, I just want to say I love everything you said, except uh, early ejaculation, we can call it premature ejaculation. Uh, I think that's a little I like to depath pathologize in my use. It's not just a young man's problem. It's uh, it's every man's problem. It's uh, it's a genetic 
it's genetic, it's neurobiological, and yes, it can be uh, managed, but it's not just a, a, a young man's problem. And, and to your point, yes, I think um, evolution and nature wants us to procreate, and it wants us to procreate as efficiently and as, uh, as effectively as possible. And I think a long or a delayed ejaculation or no ejaculation uh, would be catastrophic to the human race. On the other hand, um, we have moved from a procreative model of sexuality, which was actually the dominant model of uh, Victorian Western culture, into a relational and a recreational model. And so we want much more um, out of sex than just procreation. And uh, it, it's interesting, even when you look at um, gay and queer evolutionary biologists, you know, they reject the claim that uh, the ejaculation is solely about procreation um, because they're not looking to procreate. Um, and, and they would say that the purpose of ejaculation is affiliative, it creates connection. Um, so I guess it's all up for a fascinating debate, but, uh, but I do agree. And it's what is early ejaculation? It exists in the mind of the person who's having sex and in the person he's having sex with. It's totally determined, right? Uh, yeah, I'm even going to go again from left field before I yeah. proceed. So we have many sexual coupling that we can look at and learn from, which I'm sure you know a zillion times more than me, and that's why I'm interviewing you and not you know, the other way around. <laughs> And so if we look at a uh, lesbian couple, well, a lesbian couple can have all the beautiful uh, you know, elements of a relationship, including sexuality, love, fulfillment, uh, you know, orgasm, everything. There is no ejaculation in the picture you know, at all. So right there is a model to show us, hey, this is not the center of the universe. Yeah, I agree. There's uh, there's orgasm, uh, but there isn't uh, ejaculation, and there is actually um, there is a concept of female ejaculation, which would be uh, like the vestigial homologue of the male ejaculation. Just as we have nipples, we don't really need our nipples, guys. You know, men, people, um, but women do. So we we do have these sort of uh, what they'd be called vestigial homologs. But yes, women um, can have all the orgasms they want uh, without it necessarily the orgasm having a, a procreative function as the ejaculation does. And then even going a little bit off to the side, and I promise I'll go back to we'll the go center here. Want. Since we are talking about women now for a second, in some ways, based on a certain criteria, which may or may not be the right criteria, uh, the male typically is limited to one ejaculation. And well, young men, maybe the younger you are, maybe a little bit more, but not a lot of that. So let's say most men, if you take all the age groups, one ejaculation, I don't wanna say those very scientific words, wham, bam, thank you, ma'am, or anything like that. But the male, if we look at it from the lens of the ejaculation, there is a certain limit on how many of those a male can have. Whereas if we go to the female side, at least in principle, it's unlimited. So one could almost argue that from this narrow lens, the woman is the superior sexual being. Sure, if, I mean, if we even wanna use terms like inferior and superior, but yes, you know, uh, you are correct that uh, uh, men go, blood goes into the male genitals very quickly and, and, and enables that kind of um, uh, explosive ejaculation. And for women, which is part of this gap in pleasure, because in women, um, arousal can happen much more uh, slowly. And there can be much more of a plateau period uh, before orgasm that men don't really have. And on the other side of orgasm, yes, you're right. Women take a much longer time generally to go into a pre-aroused state, which means they're staying in a semi-aroused state, which gives them the capacity to legitimately have authentic orgasm as long as who knows. Uh, and yes, men go very quickly back to 
the pre-aroused state and do not have the same capacity uh, for multiple orgasms. And so when we hear the term male multiple orgasms, we're not really thinking about it in the way that we would think about female orgasms as real discrete uh, physiological events that result in contractions of the pelvis and anus. So yes, those are uh, two fundamental differences. So I know that you are a best-selling author, and if you can actually, this is not an ad for you, but I would like to know the, the content or the titles of some of the books that you think are, that you wrote, that you like, and I think that will actually lead us to where I want to go next. Sure. I have uh, two books that I like, and it's the first book and the last book, the most recent book, and I wish sometimes that everything in between could just disappear, which will happen anyway <laughs> as things go out of print. But no, my first book was um, She Comes First. And that book is still uh, quite popular um, and continues to, to sell really well. And uh, that really came out of both my experience as a therapist, but also my experience as, uh, as a man with early ejaculation and um, really realizing that for women, the, um, the clitoris is really the powerhouse of the female orgasm and requires stimulation, uh, not necessarily um, penetration. And so it was really the first book where I wanted to um, break free what I, from what I call sort of like the intercourse discourse or this idea that intercourse is the main way to have sex or the only way to have sex. And specifically with she Comes First, it also looked at the pleasure gap um, between men and women and that more men uh, were getting sexual satisfaction than women. And so, um, you know, the title was also suggesting a, a kind of a, uh, approach to sex or courtesy around sex. So uh, that was the first um, book. And uh, my most recent book, which I'm very proud of, is called so tell me about the last time you had sex, which is um, a question that for years I have been asking almost all of my sex therapy patients, individuals, and couples, because when someone tells me about a sexual event, I get to see sex in action and where the problem appears in what I call the sex script, the sequence of uh, events, emotional, physical, um, mental, and where to rewrite um, a person's sex script so that they don't have those same problems. So th those are the two books I'm most fond of. So if I even go by the title of the first book, She Comes First, I think it already reflects the, you know, the evolution in our thinking over history, because obviously throughout history, it was all about the male pleasure and you know the royal we, we need to have a son we need to have a, you know that all of that thing and then there are even to this day very unfortunately some cultures where they are so adamant that the woman shouldn't even have any pleasure that they do genital mutilation which is a horror unto itself uh, luckily, I believe and hope it's going out and it's not going to be there, but it did exist. So for many centuries, the focus was only on the male. And of course, in the last 100 years, probably, or 60 or whatever it is, we all have said, what is going on? This is a loving act. We are two partners. I want both of us to have fun. I really like the title, She Comes First, because men whose proclivity in many cases is to not ejaculate as slowly as they might have chosen to, almost read this title and the title spells relief. Because I think for the modern man, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm speaking as a man who lives in 2022. Uh, when, when I hear she comes first, to me personally, it spells relief, <laughs> R-E-L-I-E, it spells relief. And the reason is, 
she has experienced what I would like her to. She's already been through that. Now I feel a certain pressure is off of me because I would like, if you gave me a choice, of course the choice that most people would say, we come exactly at the same time, okay? But that is not necessarily, you know, always achievable. But for a man living in 2022, loving the woman he is with, considerate, he would like the title of your book, She Comes First. Yeah, I, I think you're really right. I mean, uh, I think there's a few dimensions to the title, but uh, I think uh, a relief from anxiety is is one of the one of the important aspects. And I think um, anxiety is at an all time high. You know, in my practice, um, I am amazed at the amount of young men, 20s and 30s, who are really suffering from uh, erectile disorder. And it's completely of a psychological nature because these are men who can masturbate or sometimes wake up with erections, um, but they have such high levels of anxiety uh, around their performance that they're, um, you know, that they have uh, erectile issues. So I, I do think that anything we can do to relieve ourselves from anxiety um, is, is important. And, and I think the other important aspect of uh, the title is if you uh, is if you accept that she comes first or you like that concept, then you have to think about like, well, what legitimately leads to the female orgasm? And uh, is it just a penetration of the vagina? Or perhaps it's, as I was saying earlier, you know, stimulation of, of, of the clitoris. And so it also compels us to rethink about how we're having sex with she comes first, because the penis is very nice for penetration and ejaculation and procreation, but for the creation of uh, pleasure and mutual pleasure, um, it's certainly not the only part of our body we have and potentially our mouths and our hands and our minds are, are more powerful. So it's also a shift to um, thinking differently about female sexuality and not just as a mirror of male sexuality. So you, you mention at the level of the genitals, if we stay at that level for a second, the, you know, the clitoral, uh, you know, orgasm, which is the more, uh, you know, available one uh, to most people. But, you know, there is a lot of uh, literature talk and practice about what goes on on the inside, not necessarily from the penetration standpoint, but the what is called the G-spot, mm. uh, which I suspect sometimes is actually the, the back side of the clitoris in some way, mm -hmm. I mean, inside. What do you think of the what is called the G spot? Uh, absolutely, I'd love to talk about that. I mean, you know, first off, what is most visible on the surface of the vulva is the glands of the clitoris, which would be the equivalent of the glands of the the penis, the head of the penis. We're only looking at one small portion of the clitoris. It's a very powerful part of the clitoris. And many women, when they um, masturbate or even during partnered sex, that's, that's sometimes the only area that needs to be stimulated or certainly um, needs that kind of stimulation. Um, but yes, just as male genitals grow outwards, female genitals grow inwards. And we should really think of the clitoris as kind of like um, a wishbone Right. So there's the tip of the wishbone and then there's sort of like these legs, you know, and the legs are on the inside and the legs are very elastic erectile tissue that wrap around uh, the first few inches, the first couple of inches of the vaginal canal. So really the head of the clitoris is very much connected to these internal structures that wrap around the entrance to the vagina. And so during penetration, um, it can be very pleasurable because it's creating vibration and reverberation against those uh, legs that really resonate. And when we're stimulating the G spot, we are not stimulating uh, an independent area in the vagina. 
we're stimulating a sensitive area of urethral sponge that is wedged in between those clitoral legs. So really what we're doing is transmitting vibration from the vagina to the clitoris. And so the G-spot uh, is really part of what I would think of as the clitoral network. Um, might not be directly uh, part of the clitoris, but it certainly is encompassed uh, by the clitoris. That's quite interesting. I mean, you talked about vibrations. So, I mean, males typically can satisfy themselves from a very, very early age. And they have a ready tool that is attached to, you know, to their body. They don't have to, they don't need anything else. But many women use, they can use their own fingers, but I believe it's quite common to use vibrating, you know, elements, mm -hmm. vibrators. I mean, do you know if it's very, very common? Is it? Do you have a sense? Because to me, I would think if I were a woman, I would want to have a couple of those. Yeah. No, no. I think, um, you know, in the wake of the sexual revolution and especially in the wake of shows like Sex in the City and you know, we live in an age where we're going through a golden age for sex toys, both vibrators for women as well as sex toys for men. And they're becoming much more commonplace and they're beautifully and elegantly designed and researched in um, many ways. And yes, they, um, they provide a vibration uh, against the clitoral glands, not necessarily intended always for vaginal penetration and for that kind of vibration, although you can do both, but yeah, and they produce a level of a uh, vibration that can really reverberate through all of the clitoral, clitoral structures uh, in a very powerful way. And increasingly what I'm noticing in my patient base, which is, um, I find very, very interesting, is that more women are comfortable using their vibrators during intercourse and during partnered sex. And men, if we're talking about heterosexual sex, intercourse, are much more comfortable reaching for the vibrator and using it. So there was a time where men were sort of threatened by these vibratory instruments, but I think now uh, have made friends with them. Well, I go back to the title of your first book. I mean, that, that can bring that goal sooner. It should be a man's best friend in some ways you know, as well. I, I agree. I mean, I think whatever whatever we can do to think um, clitorally and to not be ill-cliterate to make a, a joke, you know, um, <laughs> is, uh, is in our uh, best interest. Because when you look only at intercourse, uh, about 80% of women do not uh, orgasm from intercourse alone. They're not building requis requisite levels of arousal that result in orgasm. But when you flip it and um, you say intercourse plus or solely clitoral stimulation through oral sex or manual stimulation, uh, the statistic flips and 80% of women are having orgasms. So that's what we're aiming for is that, is that flip. Uh, but it requires... Uh, a sort of a less male-oriented model of what it means to have sex. You know, uh, I read, and maybe it's in the news also, about many things that, such as the sperm count worldwide going down radically over the past few decades. Some people attribute it to uh, toxins with, uh, you know, estrogenic properties. I don't know exactly. We can go into that. We we have and will have more interviews about the toxins that surround us. But it seems like it's not only the sperm count that is going down, it's the engagement in sexual activity that, that, that seems to go, especially uh, for some reason, the younger generation. So let's step back from it and say, if there are people who don't have sex anymore, like even a married couple who just plateaued after 30 years and they just they're just uh, visit, they're living in the same house that's it that's it 
and and maybe there is not even much in the way of uh, you know affection, hugging, kissing, holding hand. Uh, how how important is sexuality and sexual wellness to human physical and psychological health? Well. I'll answer the question with sort of a, an anecdote, which is in, in my practice, um, I meet many couples who aren't having sex, uh, many young couples who aren't having sex. And so they're certainly distressed about it, you know, because sexuality um, uh, is, is, a, is an important aspect of human function um, that needs to be, that we want to be stimulated. Um, so I'll meet many couples, young couples, and they're in sexless relationships. And then sometimes I'll meet individually with them. And, you know, when I meet the guy, very often he'll say to me, you know, I'm just not that sexually attracted to her. Uh, I'm not that sexually attracted to this person. When I was picking my partner, a lifelong partner, I was picking based on, oh, this person's my best friend or this person and I travel well together, or we love, we get along so well together. Um, so I think it's remarkable, and I see this a lot, that um, there can be a split sometimes sort of between lust and love. And sometimes these men will say, yeah, well, I had so much hot sex, but those weren't stable relationships, or those were sort of crazy. So, uh, you know, I don't expect to combine sex and love. Or sometimes they'll say, well, don't all married people stop having sex uh, anyway? Uh, which is absolutely not true. Um, so I think that there's um, sometimes a, a lot of um, beliefs that are getting in the way of allowing our sexuality to speak and to be part of everyday life in, in terms of who we want to connect with and, and how we want to connect. And I. I talk to a lot of couples about the loss of what I call the erotic thread, which is the space in between sexual events, right? What you were talking about, the, the affection, right? Like, why do our sexual selves only have to come out for sex? You know, why can't sexuality be as part of life and part of the air we breathe like all these other parts of our personality? Not sure if that was an answer or just some kind of indirect response. No, I mean, it is. I, I talk to a friend of mine who's been married for a long time, a female, you know, you know a woman. And she was complaining that uh, the sex that she has with her husband is once a week by appointment at exactly a specific time. And for her, it didn't feel satisfying, but that was his... You know, I mean, anyway, uh, there are many ways this thing can take shape. But I mean, if you have a person who is not engaged in sex, let's say you have, you know, somebody who lives in the forest by themselves in a little cabin. Uh, let's take a male first. OK, no women around. And of course, he can he can orgasm as he wants. So one could say, no, he's having sexual activity. He's, he's having orgasm. Is he missing? I'm sure, to me, it sounds like he's missing a lot. In your opinion, what is he missing? Um, to me, what he's missing, first of all, is, is, is a very important aspect of uh, connection uh, with another human being and skin-on-skin and -skin contact. But, uh, you know, Ariel, there's also this concept that, you know, when you're having sex and you reach orgasm, that you're getting into a kind of rhythmic trance state with another person, that there's literally a rhythm that you're getting so absorbed that you go into a flow state and um, into a trance-like state, and that orgasm can be the peak of that trance-like trance -like state where our self and other boundaries, our boundaries between us and other, completely dissolve. So I would say it can be um, a total merging uh, uh, with another person. Uh, and that can have profound um, relational benefits, even spiritual benefits. Um, so I think, um, I certainly think I, I've had asexual patients and I don't, um, 
I don't try and change anybody's sexual behavior. And I think it's completely valid to have a relationship that doesn't include sex or is not based on sex. But the reason I do this work, the reason I do it every day is because I believe that sexuality is a vital part of not just our own identities and how we consider ourselves, but how we connect uh, with others. And I believe that it's an aspect of our identity that for centuries is just continually repressed. And so I want to create a, a space for our sexual selves to emerge and connect. Stay tuned for part two of this interview. Thank you for joining us today. I know you love what's coming next in part two. Be sure to click the subscribe button for more videos.